next. A state park employee is killed on the job. These kind of things just don't happen in southwest Minnesota. Her clothing and her necklace were used as a ligature. There were witnesses, lots of evidence, and even a confession. He had been in and out of both federal and state prison for most of his adult life. But it still took years to put it all together. I needed to keep working on that case. State parks are usually safe, quiet, peaceful, family-friendly environments. So when Carrie Nelson had the chance to work at the Blue Mound State Park in Minnesota, she jumped at it. She greeted all of the campers and hikers that came through that office. She was the perfect person for that job. And I think she liked where you help people and care for people. That's just was her personality. Carrie enjoyed the job, but on a sunny afternoon in May of 2001, a co-worker walked into the park office and made a horrifying discovery. The sheriff, I've got a dead parks worker on the floor. A dead what? I've got a dead parks worker on the floor of the office. He found Carrie's body in a pool of blood. The discovery of her body that afternoon was certainly pretty shocking for that area. And I remember when my sister called me and she was hysterical. And at that time, um, I heard the words, Carrie's dead, and it was, it was the biggest shock I've ever had, so. Police found evidence of a life and death struggle. There was a fax machine that the phone was down off the hook and a chair that it looked to, had been damaged in it. There were papers strewn about underneath her. Unfortunately, there were no surveillance cameras in the building. The cash register was empty and so was the safe in the back room. Park officials estimated approximately $2,000 was missing, which was from camping fees and souvenir sales. The safe was located back in the office area, but when you're standing by the, the counter, you, if you were able to look straight back, you would be able to see the safe from that area. A search of the office revealed a possible clue identifying the time of the murder. We located a note that Carrie was in the process of writing, and on top of the note, she had written the date and time. The time was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and she was writing the letter to her boyfriend, actually, but it was not completed. At approximately 2 p.m., there were more than 100 park visitors and employees on site. Investigators learned that Carrie was fearful of one of those employees, Stephen Barber a 26-year-old maintenance man. Carrie told one of her friends that she felt that Barbara st was stalking her and that he just would not leave her alone. Carrie and several co-workers knew that Barbara smoked crack cocaine and was dealing it on the job. Carrie had stated that she was considering talking to the police uh, about uh, possible drug use by this employee. Was it possible that Barber found out Carrie was about to turn him in? The $2,000 could have been a motive as well. Because Barber is involved in narcotics, we felt that he, his motive could have been for, to get the money from the safe. Even more incriminating, Barber had no alibi for the time of Carrie's murder. My beautiful little girl, will never come running into my arms again saying, I love you, Daddy. Whoever did this must be caught so that they can never do it again. For the medical examiner, it wasn't difficult to determine what happened at the crime scene. There were perfectly round blood drops near both the cash register and the safe. DNA test showed the blood was Carrie's. Carrie could have been struck in the nose with a hand, with another object, 
and then had a nosebleed. And then as she was being taken into the area where the cash register was, then she was depositing that blood. Small hemorrhages in Carrie's eyes showed that the killer applied force to her neck. I believe we're in an effort to control her. I think her clothing and her necklace were used as a ligature. And, and then the little hemorrhages occurred as, as that event was happening. The medical examiner found no evidence of sexual assault. The cause of death was blunt force trauma. It appeared that she had been struck with some type of heavy object that had resulted in extensive head and facial injuries that I ultimately showed had led to her death. At Blue Mound State Park, there is only one way in and one way out, and everyone who enters the park is supposed to have a permit. But in a potential setback, investigators learned that the entrance isn't always monitored. There is certainly possibility that there were people that were in that campground that we didn't know about. The park was isolated. There were hundreds of acres in which the killer could disappear, which worried investigators. One camper reported seeing a car speeding past his campsite, located a short distance from the park office. He saw this large white boat type of car uh, leaving the area of the office, going rapidly, spinning its tires. Although he didn't see the car's license plate and couldn't identify the make or model, he did recall when it passed by. It was between 2.15 and 2.30 p.m. Carrie did work alone in the office. The last person to see her alive was a camper. Uh, who came in at 1.53 and bought a permit to go into the park. And Carrie's body was found at 2.44, which put the white car at the scene at the time of the murder. <laughs> Stephen Barber, the park employee who'd been stalking Carrie before her murder, owned a car that fit this description. Barber owned a white four-door Cadillac that we would describe as a boat-like vehicle. When questioned by police, Barbara denied any involvement. He claimed he was at his daughter's birthday party at the time of the murder. He had arrived at the party about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Given the time frame of the homicide, he still could not be ruled out as a possible suspect. Police found nothing in Barbara's car or house that tied him to the murder. At the crime scene, next to Carrie's body, was a wristwatch. She's almost literally pointing to it. One end of the leather wristband had been torn off. That certainly suggested that it had come off in the struggle. The watch wasn't Carrie's. Stephen Barber denied owning it, and none of Carrie's co-workers recognized it. Also near Carrie's body was a pack of Doral brand cigarettes. Carrie was not a smoker. and We determined that there was no employees at the state park that smoked Doral cigarettes, so therefore we determined that they were most likely left by the suspect. Investigators found no prints on the watch or on the cigarette pack. So forensic technicians used heated super glue in the office, which releases vapors that adhere to the amino acids in fingerprints. It was a fairly monumental task because, obviously, with that n large number of people coming through that agency, uh, there would have been a, a, a tremendous amount of fingerprints left on various surfaces. With this technique, investigators found 135 latent prints. None of those prints matched their suspect, Stephen Barber. Scientists also swabbed the watch found next to Carrie's body. They found a mixture of three different DNA profiles. One was Carrie Nelson's, probably a result of her pulling the watch off of the perpetrator. Neither of the other two profiles matched the DNA of Stephen Barber. We really felt Barber was our man, and all of a sudden the forensic evidence starts coming back and saying this is not him. Investigators were finding forensic evidence. They just didn't have a suspect to compare it to. 
Five days after Carrie Nelson's murder, detectives found what they believed to be the murder weapon. It was a decorative rock with the state park logo found lying in a small stream a mile and a half from the crime scene. I'd obviously looked out of place, and not to mention the fact that it was missing from the visitor center, the same visitor center where Carrie Nelson had just been murdered. Chips from this rock were found scattered around Carrie's body. The white car witnesses all leaving the scene would have gone right by this stream. The perpetrator, if he drove alongside the left-hand side of the road, could have thrown it from the driver's side of his car into the stream. But stream water had washed away any potential evidence that could have identified the killer. I took photographs of the injuries on Carrie's body, and I was able to match up areas of that rock very well with certain injuries on Carrie's face and head. Investigators spent hours comparing the fingerprints from the crime scene to all of the park employees and the campers who were in the park the day of the murder. 97 of those came back to employees, leaving us with 38 unidentified latent fingerprints that could potentially have been the perpetrator. The prints were entered into the statewide database of known criminal offenders, and there were no matches. We were very surprised that we weren't getting hits on this because our, our assumption was that, you know, this was not this person's first crime. The DNA profiles found on the watch were also entered into the statewide database of known criminal offenders. Unfortunately, the mixed samples created problems. When we are working with mixtures, um, we are working with combinations of DNA types, and so we can't identify just that single individual. Analysts found 19 potential matches in the Minnesota database. We were hoping that at least one of those 19 people would turn out to be our uh, suspect and that we'd be able to solve the case that way. But it was not to be. Each of those 19 people was investigated and cleared. I don't think any of us ever gave up hope. There's a little bit of you that doesn't want to relive it, and then there's a little bit of you that wants to know who did it. It was very frustrating for investigators. You've got eyewitness accounts of a white car speeding away from the crime scene. You've got a watch that has DNA evidence on it. One year passed, and then investigators got a break. An inmate came forward who said his cellmate, Anthony Flowers, admitted killing Carrie Nelson in the state park. Mr. Flowers had a very lengthy criminal history. He essentially was a career bank robber and had been in and out of both federal and state prison as a result of that for most of his adult life. Records showed that Flowers had broken out of prison just days before Carrie's murder and was still at large when the murder and theft occurred. Strangely, the inmate's story didn't match the crime, and neither did the evidence. None of his prints matched those at the scene, and his DNA uh, eliminated him as being a contributor to any of the DNA found on the watch at the scene. But why did the inmate come forward to implicate his cellmate? It turned out both of them were after the money. There was a substantial reward for information leading to the arrest of the person responsible for Kerry Nelson's homicide. He would then collect the, the reward money and then split it up with Flowers. And they also found evidence that Flowers much preferred the amenities of the state prison to the federal prison system. Flowers is a person that was looking at spending the rest of his life in federal prison. And we believe that he wanted to admit to this homicide to get put into the state prison in Minnesota, which would be a more comfortable stay for him for the rest of his life. Again, the case turned cold. For the next five years, investigators continued to pursue various leads, more than 600 in all, and none of them panned out until investigators took one more look at the forensic evidence. 
After five years of searching for Carrie Nelson's killer, scientists decided to try something different. By 2006, DNA technology was much more advanced than it was in 2001, and the results were far more precise. So investigators asked scientists if they could retest the watch found at the crime scene. The watch band was woven from nylon, and investigators wondered if sweat from the killer might have seeped into the material. Sweat itself doesn't really contain DNA, but what happens is cells that have the DNA end up kind of getting washed off of the body in the sweat, and so then that sweat gets deposited on the watch. Investigators were able to isolate skin cells from the wristband, which they subjected to a DNA test. The result was a mixture of two DNA profiles. From looking at the profile, I could tell that it was probably a mixture of a man and a woman. The female DNA was not Carrie Nelson's, and the male DNA didn't match any possible suspects or anyone in the Minnesota DNA database. But the cigarette pack at the scene gave investigators an idea. The cigarettes still had the South Dakota tax stamp on them, so that suggested, of course, that they were purchased in uh, South Dakota. So investigators sent the DNA profile to authorities in South Dakota and asked them to compare it to DNA profiles in their state's database of known criminal offenders. I heard back from South Dakota that we had a hit. The DNA from the watch band matched Randy Swaney, a 35-year-old petty criminal who was currently serving a 30-month sentence in South Dakota for burglary. He was a person who would case out places before he'd burglarize them. So it was possible that he had came to the state park that day to initially just case it out. But investigators wondered who had contributed the female DNA found on the watch band. Police went to the most logical source, Randy Sweeney's wife, Dawn. As they expected, her DNA was the other half of the mixture. That meant that she was a possible suspect. So we had to account for her whereabouts. But investigators learned that Dawn was at work at the time of the murder, a solid alibi. She would wear the watch to work on occasion, and this would explain why her DNA would be on the watch. Dawn also provided this photograph, which showed Randy Sweeney wearing the watch. In one of the photographs, the pin from the watch band itself is in the same location that you can tell from the wear mark on the watch that was found uh, at the scene. A second photo showed Sweeney with a pack of Durrell cigarettes. He also owned a large white car. The car that Randy Sweeney and his wife owned fit that description of the one scene leaving the park on the day of the murder exactly. And palm prints found on the counter at the crime scene and on a piece of paper near Carrie's body both matched Randy Sweeney. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and it looks like a duck, it's a duck. In May of 2007, Randy Sweeney was charged with first-degree murder. I did not kill Carrie Christine Nelson. Prosecutors believe Sweeney walked up to the park office, looked inside, and didn't see anyone there. So he entered the office, opened the cash register, and that's when Carrie walked out of the bathroom and confronted him. There was a fight. Sweeney hit Carrie and she ripped the watch from his wrist. Sweeney dragged Carrie to the back room and forced her to open the safe. After he took the $2,000, Sweeney decided not to leave any witnesses. He picked up the decorative rock and struck Carrie five times. The force of the blows caused his cigarettes to fall from his pocket. He left with the murder weapon and threw it in the nearby creek, thinking he'd removed all of the incriminating evidence from the crime scene. Little did he know, he actually left 
most of it behind. Life is precious and fragile, and that can change in a moment's notice. You know, Carrie was killed an hour before she was supposed to get off work. She had plans that evening with her friends. Randy Sweeney was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. The security measures both at uh, Blue Mound State Park and at other state parks uh, changed significantly as a result of this crime. You've got a defendant who adamantly denied ever being at this particular spot. But the forensic evidence didn't leave any doubt. Randy Sweeney was there whether he wanted to admit it or not. With Carrie, I had a poster, and I kept that at my desk for the entire time uh, until after the trial was over uh, to remind me uh, that I needed to keep working on that case. And so she was always looking at me uh, saying, well, I've given you what you need to get, so get her done.